I've, uh, you, I hope you can forgive me. I've slightly changed the content a little bit, largely because we've got some recent results that we were very excited about. Um, they're not quite published. I mean, they're on a preprint server, but I thought we'd give you the stuff. I show you some of the stuff that's kind of hot off the press uh, and the most exciting stuff that's, um, uh, that's happening at the moment. Um, uh, as you mentioned, our, our core focus is really at the moment on um, measuring the mass of single proteins, uh, of single biomolecules in solution. Um, and in many ways, you know, the, the, the ideas are not, or, you know, what we do is not that different uh, compared to the, you know, to the previous talk there is, you know, using light in order to make particles and separate them, etc. Um, in, in our case, the, the kind of particle dynamics are happening naturally, um, but we, we're using light in order to try and quantify them and visualize them. And, and the principle is quite simple. Um, uh, you know, it's shown in this, this, uh, this figure here where I think you will all agree with me that if you, if you just held a single protein or a single biomolecule in space and you shine some light on it, there will be some interaction between the light and the protein. Uh, you can think about a shadow, you can think about light scattering, it doesn't really matter, but all that matters is that in, that interaction is not going to be zero. And uh, you may also agree with me that if you had two proteins, that that interaction might be twice as big, okay, very simplistically speaking. And, and that's really the idea, that if you can do this, not only can you detect proteins, but you can also measure their mass. And the reason is that two proteins weigh twice as much as one protein, uh, and if they produce twice the optical signal, then you can relate the optical uh, the optical signal to the mass. Um, and now, you know, a key question would be why would you want to do this, right? Um, and the answer is that ultimately everything that happens in your body, in nature, you know, everything associated with any kind of regulatory function uh, always involves uh, molecules coming together and falling apart. Right. So the example that I show here is, uh, um, you know, ubiquitination. So sometimes proteins misfold and they're not good for you. So the, the, the nature has developed a you know complex mechanism, a whole bunch of enzymes that tag these misfolded proteins so that they get chewed up by the proteasome. And the reason why this is good that it's happening is because, of course, these misfolded proteins are associated with, for example, neurodegenerative disease. So you want to get rid of them. Um, now, you may want to study this because you're interested in the fundamental mechanisms, but uh, once you understand them, then maybe you can use them for something uh, uh, helpful, like uh, new types of drugs. And that's exactly what people are doing at the moment. They're developing small molecules that couple these ubiquitination enzymes to specific targets so that you can use the intrinsic system of the the body, so to say, to target specific proteins and get rid of them in a, in a, in a therapeutic context. Um, and now we always draw these things, just like if you're a chemist, right, you might draw uh, reaction mechanisms with arrows, and there you're worried about uh, bonds being formed or broken between atoms. And really, biology is no different, except that most of the interactions you're dealing with are non-covalent interactions, right? And the question is, how do you visualize this, right? And you know, I'm not going to go into uh, all the possible methods that are out there, but of course, one of the ways that you can visualize something as small as a single protein is by interference. And you, you know, you've probably all seen this at some point, and I'm sure you understand the basics of what's going on here, right? You have sun, you have light from the sun coming and hitting the interface. You have water, and you have some oil. And depending, uh, and you get two reflections, one reflections from the oil-air interface and another reflection from the water-oil interface. And depending on the thickness of that oil layer, uh, you get a different color because of constructive and destructive interference. And in fact, you can do some calculations and you know, if the oil layer is 95 nanometers thick, then uh, it will look green. And if the oil layer is 100 nanometers thick, then it will look yellow, right? Um, so you are, even when you're using the sun as a light source and your eye as a detector, you are actually able to clearly see changes on the size scale of a single protein, right? Five nanometers is, is, just, is the size of a single protein. Of course, where I cheat is here you integrate the, the, the signal over a large area, but, right, if you use a lens, uh, then you can at least reduce that area to 200 nanometers. So maybe not quite five by five by five, but, but you're not that far off. Um, 
And uh, you know, it will come as no surprise to you, and you will know that you know this is not a new concept. This is something you know the, the use of interference uh, to see sense small objects or see, see small objects is not really new. It's been around for a long time. Um, you know, you can go all the way back to phase contrast microscopy. Then you have uh, uh, lots of different implementations of uh, reflection microscopy, and essentially, as time goes by. You know, we get better light sources and better detectors and better ways of analyzing the, the data, and we've become more and more and more and more sensitive. And, uh, you know, as Vahid mentioned last week, right, so about 20 years ago, we've really reached this kind of five nanometer scale uh, uh, through the detection of gold nanoparticles in the, you know, introduction, introduction of ice cap. And about 10 years ago, there were two papers that came out pretty much at the same time, one from Vahid's group and one from our group where basically we show that uh, indeed, if you use this approach, you shine light on a sample and you look at the light that comes back, uh, the scattering from an individual protein sitting at an interface is sufficient that you can generate optical contrast and see it. Uh, and the way that uh, in both cases, we convinced ourselves that what we're seeing really is a single protein is by evaluating the size of the signal and realizing the signal is proportional to the polarizability, and if it's proportional to the polarizability, it's proportional to the mass. All right. So this 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 very kind of hand wavy concept that I started with, you know, one two proteins produce twice as much as one protein, uh, uh, kind of uh, um, uh, became a reality. But you know, the real question for us then was, okay, so it's one thing to see to detect a protein in a label free fashion. But then the next question is, okay, can we actually measure the mass, right? Uh, and once we've measured the mass, can we differentiate different species by, by the molecular mass, okay? And the reason why that's so important is if you're trying to study mechanisms like the one that I've shown here, the only way that you're going to really be able to do that using an approach like the one that I've just described is A, when you can uh, measure the mass and therefore you know you know, this proteasome has a very different mass than, for example, this enzyme here. And the second thing you need to be able to do is you need to be able to differentiate. Because in most cases, you have a complex mixture, you have lots of stuff floating around. So you need to be able to tell the difference between this one and this one and this one. And this, one. Right. And this is why both the accuracy and the resolution are incredibly important if you're going to use this method uh, uh, to study uh, biomolecular interactions and dynamics. And the challenge that we had is, is one of contrast, right? So this is our image, and these were individual motor proteins that are about 500 kilodalton, so relatively large complexes. Um, and you can see, you know, one problem is that the contrast is very low, right? So the amount of signal that you get is not very big, and that will not come as a surprise because proteins are very small compared to the wavelength of light. And uh, you have background that you're dealing with because, you know, in, in light scattering, essentially anything that's uh, that's around will also produce a signal. And so in order to really be able to leverage this potential, uh, you know, we had to go and work hard to try and Im both improve the contrast and try and try and lower the noise. And this is one of these annoying slides that PIs put up, right, where some uh, people have gone and spent many, many years working very, very hard, and then you put it all in one slide and talk about it in 40 seconds. Um, but essentially, one aspect that was critical is that we slightly changed the way that we do the illumination and the detection that enabled us to um, change the ratio between light that is scattered by the protein and light that is reflected at the interface. And if you increase the amount of, or if you decrease the amount of reflected light while keeping the amount of scattered light constant, what will happen is your contrast will get bigger. So you enhance the contrast. And then as so often, if you, 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 know, you make your measurement better and more sensitive, all you find out is that you now have discovered lots of noise sources you didn't know existed. Um, and so then we had to uh, really work quite hard to improve the environmental stability of the instrument. And indeed, at the moment, you know, if we're doing uh, good measurements, um, you know, here you have a glass cover slip and you have a protein sitting here. If this glass cover slip moves by more than an angstrom in 100 milliseconds, your measurement is ruined. Okay, so uh, everything has to be really quite uh, mechanically stable and and uh, um, insensitive to environmental perturbation. 
So this is the kind of the Oxford solution to the problem. So we built a giant metal box uh, that was heavy and we put it on little inner tubes from, uh, from wheelbarrows. Uh, um, uh, and this is our acoustic isolation, if you like, a styrofoam box. And with that, we could, um, we could really eliminate or minimize the influence of external perturbations. And then finally, we had to work on the data analysis to really extract very, very uh, precisely the signal from every single molecule. And if you do all of that, then you start creating movies like the one that you see here. So what you see is you see little black dots. And every one of these little black dots is one protein landing on a glass surface. And the reason why it appears and disappears is a consequence of the, the way that we analyze the data. It's not because proteins bind and unbind. Um, so you can see the individual dots and you see most of them are quite faint, but every once in a while you see more intense ones, right? And if you make a little white dot for every single one of these uh, landing events, and the contrast is along this axis and time is along this axis, you'll immediately see that uh, the dots bunch up, right? So there's a, there's a first band and there's a second band where you can easily see. And if you integrate up, you see a third band and possibly even a fourth band. And the signal is equally separated in contrast. Right? And the easy explanation for that is the first band is a monomer, the second band is a dimer, the third band is a trimer, and the fourth band is a tetramer. Right? Uh, and that's the key thing. We can now tell the difference between one and two and three and four, or we can tell the difference between two proteins being apart and two proteins being together. Uh, and the second thing was the accuracy. So if we took a, take a whole bunch of proteins, you know, here you have maybe 25. By now there's hundreds, if not, if not thousands that people have measured. Um, and you evaluate the, the, the relationship between the contrast and the sequence mass, the nominal mass of the protein that you're looking at, the accuracy is on the order of about 2%, which is pretty good, right? I mean, if you're doing mass spec, you will see, say it's terrible. Uh, if you're me, you say that's fine because if I have a 100 kilodalton protein, on average, I will measure between 98 and 102. So it will give me confidence that I'm looking at the protein that I think uh, that I'm looking at. So this was now uh, a little more than five years ago. Um, and since then, we've spent quite a lot of time you know, figuring out, is this actually useful? What can you use this for in the, in the kind of bigger biological context? So quite a lot of people are using it to look at assembly, right? For instance, uh, how do you go from you know, individual proteins to in solution to something like a capsid? And that's important, for example, in, in the context of cell and gene therapy, where people are making uh, gene delivery vehicles. Uh, it's very useful for interactions and kinetics, right? Because if you write an equilibrium constant that says, how many free species do I have and how many uh, uh, complexes do I have? If you can count them, then you can immediately extract uh, the affinity. And then we also wanted to see whether it works just for polypeptides uh, or whether it works for nucleic acids. And at the, at the time, it wasn't obvious to me that a you know, a, a protein ball I can kind of imagine to be like a nanoparticle, but a, a, a DNA strand is just a molecular wire. And it turns out DNA strands also produce a relatively uh, similar signal. Um, and this kind of, this ability to tell the difference between different species, the ability to measure mass has really been kind of the driving force. You know, there's now hundreds of instruments thousands of users across academia and, and, and industry that are really using this as a tool uh, uh, to study um, uh, biomolecules. Uh, and I'm just going to tell you one story that has you know, taken us a long time over the last three years or so, where we use this method to try and figure out what's going on, if you like. Right. So uh, I'm sure you're all by now tired of the whole COVID story, right? But in, in a way, it's quite a quite quite an interesting aspect in terms of, you know, how 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 biomolecules interact. And in 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 the in the context of COVID, it's a relatively simple story. You have your virus on the surface of the virus. You have these uh, surface pro viral surface proteins called spike proteins. And the first step in the infection is that they bind to an enzyme that you find on the surfaces of cells, and they're quite significantly expressed in lung tissues. Therefore, uh, it's, it's, uh, um, uh, it affects the lungs, called ACE2, right? So uh, for infection, these two interact. And then, of course, at some point, your body says, no, 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 uh, we don't want to keep doing this. And it starts to develop antibodies against the spike protein, 
And then the antibodies have to interfere with this interaction. And that's when you, you know, either you don't get sick or you get healthy again, right? And of course, if you take a vaccine, then you, uh, you, you produce this in advance. So you're ready in case, in case the virus comes and you never get sick. So the key thing is, you know, what is the nature of this interaction? And if you're making drugs, how do you make something that outcompetes the native interaction? And if you look at the, the literature, right? And if you look at the, the kind of how people study this, um, you realize that we, we mostly live in a one-to-one -one interaction world, right? So there's usually two things that people do. One is they do structural biology. They get the structure of the, of the protein. They uh, bind the ligand to it. They get the overall structure and you get an idea of what the complex looks like. And then you run some kind of assay, like a surface-based assay, for example, that tells you about the interaction strength. But both of these methods really only function in a one-to-one -one context, okay? Because as soon as you have oligomeric species here, your structural characterization doesn't work, uh, and the models that you use here really rely on one-to-one -one interactions. But of course, the problem is that none of the players involved here are you know, individual species. The spike protein is a trimer, so it has three identical domains. Uh, ACE2 is a dimer, so there's two identical domains, and antibodies have two uh, binding domains, all right? So everything that is interacting is multivalent. All right, so you may say, well, okay, who cares? Why is that important? Well, here are two examples why it's important. So one of the early therapeutics that people suggested in the context of COVID was to actually make ACE2, right, which is the enzyme that is on the surface of your cell. And the idea is if I just flood someone with extra ACE2, solution-based ACE2, I will cover the virus with, a, with ACE2 and therefore it can't bind to the cell. And indeed, when you do that, you, have, you can do two different things. You can use a monomeric construct, so that's just one, or you can use a dimeric construct, which is two. And uh, it turns out that dimer is 100 times better at neutralizing the virus than the monomer. Okay, so that's important if you're trying to uh, uh, develop a drug. Um, but also you can look at antibodies that come from patients, right? So you get COVID and you can harvest the antibodies from you and then uh, study the antibodies. Uh, and you can also rip the antibodies apart. And rather than having the full construct, which is your Y, you just take the bit that binds to the, to the spike individually. And those are the empty circles. And again, if you go from the individual bits to the full antibody, you have a two orders of magnitude improvement in the efficacy in terms of neutralization. So it's all well and good to characterize the interactions on a one-to-one -one level, uh, but, but multivalency has a massive impact uh, in terms of both the affinity of the virus to the, to the target and uh, in terms of the affinity of something else that might outcompete uh, the virus binding to the cell. So we thought, okay, fine, you know, we can, we, can, we can visualize individual proteins, we can visualize complexes, so maybe this is a good way uh, to study this interaction, all right? So if you take spike, spike proteins, so these are these, every one of these dots here is one of those spike trimers, right? And uh, you measure the signal, and just like I showed you before, from that you can ma make this kind of distribution, and because the spike is so big, you know, now your peaks are separated, so this is a spike trimer, this is a dimer of a trimer, a trimer of a trimer, and so on. And then you titrate in your ACE2, and you see when you titrate in some ACE2, you see this little peak appear here and this little peak appear here. And that's essentially one ACE2 binding to your spike trimer. And if you want to characterize the interaction, then you, you do a titration, right? So you add more ACE2, and when you add more ACE2, everything's good. Your, second, your, your, your ACE2 bound peak gets bigger. And you add even more ACE2, <coughs> excuse me, and suddenly all the spike was gone. All right? So... Uh, you know, we had a conversation, the student went back to the experiment again, same thing happened again. And then you look at what you, you see in the microscope, and suddenly in the microscope, you see this stuff, right? So, so you see, rather than having these nice little black dots, which correspond to individual protein complexes, you get these huge balls that are floating around. And in fact, if you look at, you know, on a logarithmic scale of mass versus uh, frequency, you see that uh, very, very large objects start to appear as you titrate in ACE2. So in other words, what's happening is the ACE2 is making uh, nanoparticles of cross-linked ACE2 and spike. Okay? That's what this data suggests. 
So this is what happens if you mix ACE2 and spike at high concentration in solution. But you can also do this at low concentration and really get out of thermodynamics, OK? So uh, here is adding monomeric ACE2. So this is just one, right? And if you titrate it in, you see one bound, two bound, three bound. You can fit that. You can count how many there are. And you can build a thermodynamic model that tells you what the affinity is. OK, 170 nanomolar, fine. And then uh, you take um, uh, the, the normal dimeric ACE2. And again, you see one bound. You see two bound. You almost never see three bound. But the curious thing here is you, if, you, if you look at compare this data, for example, or this data with this one, you see that you have a huge one bound peak, but almost no two bound. And the only way you can fit this data is if you put in a penalty for the second ACE2 to bind. So the first one comes, but the second one really doesn't want to come. So it's negative cooperativity, right? So for the original strain of COVID, uh, it's, neg it's, it's negative cooperative. The second one doesn't want to bind. Then you can take Omicron, which is a much more infectious variant, right? And you see the exact opposite, right? So you have quite a lot two bound in the presence of one bound. So in Omicron, once the first ACE2 has bound, the second one really wants to bind. But curiously, the one-to-one -one affinity of Omicron is about only half as strong as the one-to-one -one affinity of Wuhan. So you have a more infectious variant that binds weaker, but is much better at binding multiple, uh, multiple ACE2s. Now you do all of this, and then the ultimate, you know, the question eventually comes, as you saw from the original graph, is well, but all of this stuff is happening on membranes, right? You have a you have a cell membrane and you have a virus membrane, so you're doing all of this in solution. Why does it matter? And the good news is the experiments that I've shown you on on glass now you can do on bilayers. So this is work done by Eric Foley and Manish, and also by uh, Petra Schwille group at the same time. And essentially, uh, if you make a lipid bilayer and you attach individual spikes you'll see them diffuse around, okay? So every one of these black dots is one spike trimer diffusing around on, a, on, a, on an artificial membrane on top of glass. And now you'll get two pieces of information. You get information about the mass because that's proportional to the signal. And you get information about the uh, mobility, right? Because you get a diffusion coefficient for every single particle. And your data then becomes a two-dimensional plot. So you have mass on one axis and you have diffusion coefficient on the other axis. And if you just take spike, you see that you just get mainly one peak, which is the spike protein only. If you add ACE2, you see your spike, you see one bound, two bound, and then suddenly down here, you get a new population. And that population is about twice the mass because it's two spikes. And it moves at half the speed as the original one, right? Because you go from a diffusion coefficient of one micron squared per second to half a micron squared per second. Why? Because in this region, you have one spike diffusing in the membrane. And in the other one, you have two spikes that are coupled by an ACE2 together diffusing in the membrane, and they're slower. All right. OK. So uh, what about Omicron? Right. So this is this is your original strain. And now, if you take Omicron, you see the same thing again, but uh, you not only can you see the dimer, but you can now even see the trimer of spike. All right, so this spike Omicron binding weaker, now you can directly observe that indeed what the ACE2 is doing, it is oligomerizing the spike. All right, so the, the ACE2 is cross-linking different, different spikes together. And then you ask yourself the question, well, is this, is this just a trick of, you know, is this just ACE2? Because if you take an antibody, that's what an antibody looks like. An antibody has two binding sites, and they're separated by, I don't know, 8, 9, 10 nanometers or so. So do antibodies do the same thing, right? Does the immune system use the same trick uh, to, block, uh, 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 to block the spike? And of course, we're quite lucky here in Oxford because, uh, you know, through the NHS, there's lots of lots of activity in terms of uh, being able to characterize these interactions. There's a paper a few years ago where what they actually did is they took antibodies from 50 patients, and then they looked at where all of these antibodies bind relative to the spike, okay? And so I'm just gonna show you three because they're quite representative of what's going on. So you have uh, um, 
you have uh, antibody 384, which binds to RBD. That's the receptor binding domain. That's the domain that ACE2 binds to. You have 150 that also binds to the receptor binding domain. And then they found this one patient, 159. And that was really weird because it didn't bind to the receptor binding domain. So that's strange, right? Uh, what you're trying to do is you're trying to block the interaction between ACE2 and spike. So what you would think is the antibody binds to the same uh, part of the protein or the same epitope. But no, here it binds somewhere completely different. And so the question is, how does it how does it even work? And sure enough, when you look at these inhibition curves, right? So 159, which is the one that binds, does not bind to the receptor binding domain. If you just take uh, um, one part of the one part of the antibody, it does not inhibit at all. Right? It doesn't do anything. But as soon as you put it together, it works quite well. And then sometimes for the situations like 150, whether you use the, the, the bit that binds correctly or whether you use the full antibody makes no difference. And in some cases, it makes a huge difference. And now we can actually visualize this, right? So if you take 150, which is the one where everything is the same, you see very strong binding to the spike and very little oligomerization. And then you take 159, which is the one that does not bind to the receptor binding domain, and you see very, very strong oligomerization. And if you take 384, uh, which is the good one, also binds to the receptor binding domain, you see good binding and you see oligomerization. And then you can make a variant of the spike that is in the conformation that binds to ACE2. And in this case, you see the antibody just oligomerizes everything, right? So you basically, you lose all individual spike proteins. And just like before, we can quantify all of these different species. So we know how much we have of each of them. We can build a thermodynamic model. And now we can actually evaluate the one-to-one the -one affinity and we can evaluate the cross-linking affinity. And what you find is 150, which is a relatively poor antibody, right? Has very poor cross-linking. 159 doesn't even bind, uh, uh, but has very strong cross-linking. And 384, which is the very best one, which does both. It binds to the right domain and it cross-links it. And once you have this, these, these affinities, uh, then you can take it one step further. Because of course, if you look at the virus, the density of these spike proteins is about a thousand times bigger than it, than it was in our experiments. Because in our experiments, we have to be able to see individual ones. So they have to be far apart. But on the surface of the virus, they're very close. So you can do a calculation in terms of um, how the density of these proteins affects how tightly it binds. And essentially what happens is, this is if you had just one-to-one -one binding, and the blue curve over here is what you get at the density uh, of the surface of the virus in the presence of these multivalent interactions. And sure enough, the enhancement you get is about two orders of magnitude, okay? So what, why is this important, right? Well, the first thing is, um, if you look at the, the majority of the literature, usually a new variant comes out, uh, there's a measurement of definity and it says, oh, you know, it binds stronger and therefore it's better. Um, but that's not necessarily true, right? Uh, because what we're seeing is this is this oligomerization. And and why is that interesting? Well, one of the reasons why it's interesting is if you you know if you put your mind to the virus, right? ACE2 is expressed in lots of tissue. Um, you don't just want to bind tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. You want to be specific. It's called tropism, right? You want to you want to find the tissue that has just the right uh, density of your of your target protein. Uh, and so this this oligomerization is something that can that can really help with that. But then on the other hand, antibodies use the same trick, right? Antibodies use exactly the same trick in the sense that they outcompete the natural ACE2 protein in terms of the oligomerization, and thereby block very efficiently block the surface of the virus from from being. Uh, and you can now start to think, you know, just ask the general question, you know, why do antibodies look like this? Right? Is this a much more general thing that antibodies do in terms of their mode of function, rather than just you know blocking a binding site, which is kind of the natural thing? 
Um, so I just want to finish with one thing, kind of a you know motivational thing, right? So at the end of the day, we, I think most of us who are here, we we work on microscopes, right? So uh, I always find this fascinating. So this is what cryo EM structures looked 15 years ago, right? So you had a resolution of 17 angstrom. As is you know 12 years ago, 10 angstrom, and you could see nothing here. Uh, we had four angstrom by 2015, and now we're about 1.7. So people can see hydrogens, okay? And uh, you know the, the 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 you know this is a factor of two, and it's another factor. It doesn't seem like a lot, but the information content that you get is dramatically different. So this is where we were in 2018. This is where we are at three in the morning on a Saturday, right, when nobody's around. Uh, so we're you know kind of getting to the 10 kilodalton. And if you do a theoretical cac back of the envelope calculation, what should we be able to do? You get you get to this range, right? And once you're in this kind of sub five kilodalton range, now you really are in a position where you should be able to, uh, you know, deal with complex mixtures, see all the species, see how they how they change it as a function of time. Um, now we can't do that alone, but you know the the the, the kind of the where you can go with this, I think, uh, is really quite exciting in the context of of what we can study. And with that, I think I've hopefully have not entirely overstayed my welcome. Uh, um, Thank you for listening. Uh, I have to say a big thank you to my group because they're the ones who do all the work. I have to say a big thank you to Justin Benesh, uh, without whom uh, this technology would have never developed. You know, he's a he's a proper mass spectrometrist. Uh, the people that gave his money, and like everyone else in the world, I'm looking for postdocs. So I'll just I'll just leave that leave that slide at the at the end and uh, try and answer questions if there are any. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much Philip, for a beautiful talk and. Uh... Exciting um, results. I, I guess there are questions. So who wants to start? Theo, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Philip. A very nice talk. Um, a question that I had is, I mean, if I, if I understood you correctly, you have the spike protein also on supported lipid bilayers, right? So how, like, how do you get the spike protein? Is that, um, do you produce, uh, use recombinant proteins or how do you do that? <laughs> Yeah, so it's so usually, right? I mean, everyone who uses purified protein has a tag, right? They usually you express it with a tag, and in one of the tags that people use are his tags. Mm -hmm. So in our bilayer, we put a very low concentration of lipids that have an NTA domain. So okay. essentially, the bilayer does the same thing that your column does when you do purification. And, and then if I may follow up on that, because yeah, of its sure. recombinant, I mean, if I remember correctly, a big problem for the vaccine development was that the, the spike protein is somewhat metastable. So yes. it has to be prefusion stabilized, otherwise yes. it switches back and forth, right? Yeah. Yeah. And um, so my question is, if you, I mean, this was a problem for the protein, for the vaccine developers, I think, because they basically had to get it stable so that it binds the receptors. Could you yeah. pick that up, like the metastability, and then in a sense improve it for the design of, of a protein? Well, that's to be... basically here. So Hexapro is the perfusion stabilized version. Okay. And unsurprisingly, when you take Hexapro with the patient derived antibody, it goes absolutely crazy in terms of the binding. <laughs> right? It goes completely nuts. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to the as opposed to the normal version of the of the spike, where indeed you have this switching back and forth between being able to bind and not being able to bind, so you can very very clearly see exactly exactly this difference between the two states. Are oh, you absolutely right? This is great. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. You mean you have a question? Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Frank, and thank you, Philip. So. Um, the mass photometry is really innovative and powerful tools. Uh, so the from what I understand from uh, your talk is that the correlation between optic signal and the mass is very critical. So when we apply this to a new type of molecule, so pre-calibration is always needed? Uh, yeah, well, so if you go away from polypeptides, it will be a little bit different. So if you take DNA, for example, um the the optical signal to mass is about 20 percent different and again the reaction can be that's a big difference or the reaction can be that's a surprisingly small difference i think most of these differences are quite small and the reason is because most biological material is kind of the same stuff 
right? You, you, you don't have biological material with a refractive index of three, right? It's all 1.4 something, right? And it's the refractive index that ultimately determines the con. I mean, this is why if you look at a cell, you know, in a transmission light microscope, you kind of see nothing. Mm -hmm. The reason you see kind of see nothing is because it's all the same stuff. And the only things that you do see is where you have huge differences in density, right? So when you have really tight packing, like in a nucleus, okay, then you get some contrast. But you know, getting contrast between different biologic between between different biomolecules is difficult because they all have very similar refractive indices. Yeah. So it's I think that's a good thing. You know, it's, it depends on your perspective and what you're trying to measure. Yeah, thank you. Are there more questions? I, I don't, otherwise, I would um, ask your question back. So why are uh, all antibodies shaped like that? Is is it really that it's beneficial to create oligomers uh, all over the place for antibodies? I mean, well, I, I mean, I think there are... I mean, the jury's out, yeah. and I think we're a very, 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 very long way from being able to answer that question. And and part of the reason is, you know, people don't like to use, and for good reasons, they don't like to use full constructs, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you can go through the last three years of literature, and you will find hundreds of structures and thousands of interaction characterizations, and they all have one thing in common. One of the interaction partners is monomeric. Mm -hmm. So it's either the receptor binding domain of the of the spike plus the full antibody, or it's the fab domain or monomeric ACE2 plus the full spike. Why? You kind of know the answer. And if you forgive me for clicking through, the answer why nobody uses full constructs is this. Yeah. Right? Because if you mix the full contract constructs together, you, you just get a mess. You get a mess, right? You put that into a cryo EM, forget it, right? You just get a completely heterogeneous disaster um, or stuff crashes out of solution. So working with full constructs is really, really, really tricky. Um, and that's why, you know, we kind of live in this one-to-one -one interaction world, but but full well knowing that the multivalency is important. So I don't know, you know, I asked, the, I mean, I'm not a biologist, right? But I asked, you know, llamas, they have, they produce nanobodies, right? Um, and so they monomeric. So why why not? So llamas don't have this problem. I, I don't know. I'm not a llama expert, right? <laughs> um, and I think there is also a um, there is an evolutionary component. Also, you know, the thing that bind that makes the the antibody a dimer is the FC domain, and the FC domain is important because it binds to other stuff. Um, but I, I think my takeaway here is that oligomerization is a mode of action. Right, is not just blocking a certain receptor, or is not just blocking a certain part of the protein and preventing something else from binding. It it also seems to be, um, uh, you know, clustering things together. And we've done the same studies with HIV. And the most powerful antibodies in the context of HIV are broadly neutralizing antibodies. Okay, they're like gold dust. And you know what? Big surprise. You know what? Broadly naturalized, broadly uh, neutralizing antibodies are really good at. Cross-linking the uh, the spike protein on on HIV. Okay, yes. so yeah. uh, look, we're at the very beginning here, right? We we're fighting with forty years of of life science research. So this, you know, this is this is going to be a a long stretch, and and maybe it's just coincidental, but it, it seems it seems at least um, intriguing. Let me say it that way. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Um, additional questions. I mean, I, I would have one more because you showed the last slide where you would be in 2020, question mark. Yeah. Um, so what, what is from uh, between the last two is just stabilization improvements uh, or uh, did I understand you wrong? Or what what what, what is the, um, the uh, technical improvement uh, that makes that So I, I think, so there's two, there's two big, pro big remaining problems. The biggest problem is data analysis. I'm not very good at data analysis. And if you think about it, if you took cryo-EM and you had cryo-EM and you didn't have incredibly powerful classification algorithms, it just wouldn't work, right? We, we analyze every single protein de novo 
in cryo EM, what you do is you, you classify proteins together and then you average many of them and then you then you get the result, right? Um, and I think in the, the, there's, there's huge strides to be made on the analysis. Um, the second problem is that we have one source of noise that we don't understand. We think it has something to do with density fluctuations at interfaces, but essentially it just limits our ability to make the resolution better and better and better and better, right? But I mean, to give you an idea, right? If you are, if you're at 500 kilodalton with a good instrument for us, I think the signal to noise ratio for one molecule is a hundred. Okay, it's really high. Yeah. And in order to maintain this resolution across the mass range, that means that your ability to estimate the signal has to be just as good, you know, has to be, has to really take advantage of that 100 to 1. And the equivalent of that in the super resolution community, if I may use that, right, that's, you know, when everything, the world was in order while people were going to, I don't know, 10 nanometer localization precision. And once they started to go to 1, then all hell broke loose, right? You had to you had to compensate for the camera gain, and you had to do all this kind of fancy stuff because your point spread function would be slightly distorted. Then your localization would, would would have problems, and that's that's essentially the problem we have, you know, from half a megadalton onwards. Is that the signal to noise the the theoretical signal to noise ratios are very very high, but we're just not very good at describing the the signal with sufficient or modeling the signal with sufficient accuracy to actually extract what we can measure. Which brings me back to the analysis problem. Okay, I see. Okay, there, thank you very much. So there's another question by Paola. Yes, hi. Hi, Philippe, great talk. Hi, Paola, good to see you. Hi, yes, good to see you. Yeah, I have a question from a slightly different angle, which is thinking about your lipid membrane. What about the role of lipid composition? And, you know, now you have the possibility to also look at protein lipid interaction effectively so is that a direction you are pursuing uh so we we ha i mean i'll be completely honest with you so we haven't done that yet because at the moment we're really just using the bilayer as a method to trap proteins but maybe to get you a little bit excited um in a slightly different way now if you look at this kind of movie yeah. In the original way of doing mass spectrometry, you see a protein and it's gone. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But with this, we can look at individual proteins for minutes and continuously measure them. You know, you can look at one protein for, you know, as long as it stays in the field of view, you could look at it for 24 hours if you like, right? It's, it's, it's just there. Yeah. Um, so I think in terms of what you would, will be able to extract information wise about slight differences in mobility or slight differences in interactions. And, you know, I, I, it, it's, I kind of think of this as a, you know, there's lots and lots of scope with this kind of approach in principle, yeah. but so far we've really just used it as a, as a kind of dynamic immobilization tool. Yeah. Okay, good. But yeah, sounds, sounds promising as a potential direction. Thanks. Thanks, Philip. Thank you. Okay, so Basis has another question. Yeah, I have a question regarding the integration times. So the limit which you have, mass limit, could it be improved by if you integrate longer if your protein is sticking to the substrate? Or what is uh, also the typical integration times you are using currently? Yeah. So to give you an idea, this movie is recorded at 300 hertz. So pretty fast, right? Uh, but it helps that spike is quite big. It's a 400 kilodalton protein. So it gets smaller, you have to integrate for a little bit longer. Um, the, the, the shortest times probably for our case, something like, you know, two, five milliseconds. Again, it depends a little bit on the mass. Now you're absolutely right. Wouldn't it be great if you just integrate, you know, if I integrate for a second rather than 50 milliseconds, I get a factor of 20 more photons and everything is shot noise limited. Unfortunately, it's not. Um, and then two problems appear. One is this mysterious noise that I mentioned. Uh, so if you integrate longer, you get this, this mysterious noise to appear and it just gives you a noise floor beyond which you, you know, you cannot, that we have not been able to average out. Um, uh, and the second thing is, is 
we're quite good at controlling sample drift up to 100 milliseconds. We're very bad at controlling sample drift up to a second. And of course, the longer you integrate, the better you have to be at controlling the drift, right? Because the more sensitive you are to it, and it just becomes it becomes very, very, at least in our hands, very, very, very difficult to do. Yeah, the, the mechanical stability will play a role for longer. And, you know, it's thermal. I mean, there's all yeah. kinds of stuff going on, right? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, air currents, uh, we never thought about and actually turns out to be one of the biggest, biggest, biggest enemies that we have. Mm -hmm. Tiny air currents make a huge difference. Yeah. Can I ask uh, another question, Fung, or...? Of course, you're the yeah. boss. <laughs> <laughs> the, the thing is, I, I, these are really interesting. So, um, it, I mean, I'm not an expert of machine learning, but is this something which you use it or are you considering it to improve your analysis, which you are talking about, that if you can improve analysis, which uh, maybe machine learning can help help it or? Yes. So, I mean, there is a, there is a great paper by, by Vahid, right, where they used machine learning yes. to really push the, push, push the detection limit. Um, so, in our hands, you know, we, we, we did may manage to get those kind of improvements, and there may be subtle differences in exactly how it's done. Um, I mean, our focus really has been on the resolution. Yes. You know, we're not so worried about the, you know, what's the smallest thing that we can see. For us, really, the driver has uh, has been the resolution, and in principle, it's seen. You know, machine learning can do everything, right? Can predict the weather, <laughs> can, right? Like, I mean, so no, maybe no. I should just put on my on my final slide: machine learning problem solved, <laughs> right? Um, uh, but but uh, you know, we, we're starting to collaborate with people and starting to explore it. Um, my my gut feeling is that the machine learning is likely to help most for us in the context of classification. Yeah. Um, you know, if you think about it, you need a, you know, what is a good, what is a good binding event and what is a bad binding event? The bad binding event, you mm -hmm. will not measure the, the mass accuracy. So I, I I think that's where it's going to help yeah. is, is through the classification. Because I still you know, there, it may entirely be true that this will never be possible, but I'm just deeply upset by the fact that in cryo EM you can take twenty thousand particles, average them together, and get a really good answer. And I have to analyze every single dot yeah. all by itself, right? I, I think that's unfair. So, so, so maybe maybe machine learning could could help that. And you know, even if it just did ten or a hundred particles, yeah. uh, it could be a huge help. Yeah. Thank you very much.